Yes, thanks so much for your kind uh, introduction and the ev kind invitation too. Uh, I once came across a saying that goes like this. When a German scholar gives a talk, he usually starts with an apology. When an American academic gives a talk, he usually starts with a joke. This afternoon, I will do neither. <clears throat> but I'm going to talk about international cooperation, human rights, and take the allied policies of democratization in occupied Germany as a case study. As you know, the Second World War seemed to inaugurate a new era of peace 70 years ago. International cooperation seemed to be on the agenda. Under the impact of the haunting legacy of Nazi atrocities, the victorious allied countries agreed on basic principles of a new post-war order that was to maintain stability and secure stability and peaceful cooperation between nations. As one of the most important pillars of this policy, democratization, was to prevent dictatorial rule, a new dictatorial rule, and democracy was also to prevent more genocides and wars in the future. According to the Allied plans, defeated Germany was to serve as the most important example of post-war democracy. Yet, as we know, the window of opportunity soon passed as different understandings of democracy and democratization emerged. Instead of becoming a testing ground of democracy, Germany became a battlefield of divergent and increasingly imposing conceptions of and increasingly opposing conceptions of democracy. Not least, the Germans had to appropriate democracy and to relate foreign models to the indigenous traditions of freedom and liberty that existed too. In the first part, part of, my, of the following remarks, I would like to give a broad overview of allied and particularly American plans and measures to further democracy in Germany and to promote the denazification of the Germans. Before summarizing the complex process of democratization in West post-war Germany and the role of the United States, the crucial importance of mediators for the transfer and political and cultural conceptions of democracy across the Atlantic must be dealt with. American officials, as well as German emigres and remigres, in particular, attempted to bridge the gulf between German and American conceptions of democracy. They became actors of cultural diplomacy. Cultural diplomacy entails, if I may quote Jessica Gino Hecht and our kind organizer, Mark Donfrey, Cultural diplomacy entails, quote, the direct and enduring contact between peoples of different nations. According to the 1959 definition of the US State Department, cultural diplomacy was to hope, uh, quote, help create a better climate of understanding, of international trust and understanding in which official relations can operate, unquote. As the democratization of West Germany demonstrates, however, cultural diplomacy was, has by no means been used universally been promoted and supported by soft power only. On the contrary, the asymmetric relationship between the United States of America and Germany was conspicuous in the first post-war years. In that brief period of transition, 
American policies were still integrated into an overarching allied concept of democratization. So there was a basic consensus on democracy in the first years after 1945. Although this was a fleeting moment in retrospect, the considerable potential for international cooperation in the first post-war years has been undervalued by scholars, but also by in public and political discussions. Let me turn to the allied policies of denazification and, and democratization. After the Battle of Stalingrad and the defeat of the German forces in Northern Africa, and you can hear, I'm an historian, oh, uh, it gives you some dates and some facts, but these are quite important to keep in mind. So after the Battle of Stalingrad and the defeat of the German forces in Northern Africa in early 1943, the Allied powers, that is the United States, the Soviet Union, and Britain expected the military collapse of Germany in the foreseeable future. As early as January 1943, when the Allied leaders met in Casablanca in Northern Africa, Morocco, they demanded the unconditional surrender of all German forces. Germany was to be dismembered in order to prevent a resurrection of Prussian militarism. However, high officials feared economic disruptions in Germany and insurmountable resentments among the German population. In 1944, the US Department of State finally rejected the plans for dismembering Germany. Whereas President Roosevelt still favored plans to partition Germany, not, not the least because he wanted to maintain the alliance with the Soviet Union. All Allied powers, including the Soviet Union, unanimously supported a total occupation of Germany. They envisaged a transitional period of political reorientation before a stable democracy could be established. But binding decisions were postponed until the autumn of 1944, when Allied troops reached German borders. This is commonly termed a policy of postponement postponement, which resulted from diverging interests and aims within the American administration, but also it resulted from different conceptions between the allies. But all allies agreed that German rearmament and the resurrection of Nazism and militarism, Prussian militarism, were to be prevented. These plans for, the plans for denazification were also shared by the United States, Britain, France, and the Soviet Union. These plans rested on a specific interpretation of German history, which assigned guilt and responsibility for the Nazi dictatorship to certain political and social groups like the military the big estate owners, the big industrialists, and public servants. These groups were seen as cornerstones of the German Sonderweg, the German authoritarian special path into modernity. As late as 1950, American diplomat John George Cannon argued, quote, we must remember that the German people are still political immature and lacking in any real understanding of themselves and their past mistakes, unquote. Allied powers agreed on the basic tenets of democratization and the resurrection of human rights after the collapse of the, of the Third Reich. Shaken by the impact of the horrible legacies of the Nazi policies of extermination, and unprecedented violations of human rights. The Soviet occupation authorities, as well as their American, British, and French counterparts, were determined to overcome the traditions of authoritarianism and militarism. Germany would become 
an international, a bastion of international cooperation and in human rights policies. The Potsdam Agreement of the 2nd of August, 1945, reflected the re resolution of the, of, gov of the governments of the United States, the Soviet Union, and Great Britain to achieve a genuine democratization of Germany. The foundation of the United States, too, fueled these plans in Germany and beyond. The Charter of the United States that the, that the that 40, 51 member states signed in June 1945 committed them to peace, the protection of human rights and international cooperation. Leading proponents of international cooperation like Eleanor Roosevelt, the widow of Franklin Roosevelt, lauded the UN Charter as, quote, a guiding beacon along the way to the achievement of human rights and fundamental freedoms throughout the world, unquote. Franklin D. Roosevelt's widow demanded equal access to the judiciary and an international court of justice in order to ban and sanction atrocities and extermination policies. And this was to secure the observance of human rights. The promotion of human rights became, fun, became a fundamental basis of international cooperation in the first post-war years. These efforts peaked, as you know, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that the General Assembly of the United Nations passed on the, on the 10th of December, 1948. This statement, the resolution of the 10th of December, 1948, was hailed as an, quote, event comparable to the proclamation of the Declaration of the Rights of Men by the French people in 1790, 50, uh, 1789, the adoption of the Bill of Rights by the people of the United States and the adoption of comparable declarations at different times in other countries, quote. Statement by Roosevelt's widow again. Although the gross violations of human rights committed by Nazi Germany and uh, fascist Italy were frequently mentioned in the deliberations and negotiations that preceded the Universal Declaration, the Cold War had already taken precedence over the past, over the recent Nazi past, by 1948. In fact, human rights activists like Eleanor Roosevelt emphasized that the US administration did not, quote, consider the economic and social and cultural rights stated in, declaration, in the Declaration imply an obligation on governments to assure the enjoyment of these rights by direct governmental action. The conflict between the Soviet Union and Soviet demands for the observance of social and economic rights as human rights and Western insist insistence on liberal political rights as human rights was to fuel was to reflect and fuel the Cold War that had already started to emerge when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted in 1948. By 1948, moreover, different understandings, concepts, interests, and aims had emerged between the Allied powers and even within their administrations. These rifts increasingly shaped Allied policies in Germany. Cracks in the alliance had marred international cooperation as early as 1946. Because of the controversies about the reparation problem, in particular, the big three agreed to extract economic resources from their respect respective occupation zones, which they had agreed upon at the conference of Yalta in February 1945. So the office of the military government for Germany therefore soon became the supreme authority for democratization policies in the American zone. So there was a separation of occupation zones. 
And that was a crack, of course, in the Allied consensus. What did American officials mean by democratization? Firstly, the resurrection of a pluralistic state within a constitution, with a constitution granting and protecting human rights, establishing a division of power, and enabling free, secret, and independent elections. Secondly, the American authorities strove to eradicate militaristic authoritarian values and modes of behavior by a fundamental transformation of society and political culture. So democracy was to become not only an institutional order, but a way of life. Soviet conceptions of democracy markedly differed from American understandings. In the Soviet zone of occupation, military officials of the USSR, as well as leading functionaries of the German Communist Party, largely equated democracy with social equality and economic prosperity work for all. And these cornerstones of a democracy Soviet style were to be secured by a planned economy, not a market economy. It was, a, it was also to be secured by the expropriation of capitalist, so-called capitalist entrepreneurs and the exclusive rule of the vanguard, so-called vanguard, of workers and peasants. So we had different and increasingly divergent conceptions of democ democracy in Germany. Let me now turn to a few remarks on the subtle transfer of democracy from the United States and the role of mediators. Obviously, democracy could not be imposed on the Germans. Rather than being enforced and imposed, democracy had to be adopted by them. It was small wonder then that the West German democracy established in the course of the 1950s and 1960s was by no means identical to the American political system. On the contrary, American models had to be adapted to prevailing conditions and preconditions and traditions. In Germany, traditions of liberty, traditions of freedom that Germany had experienced in the mid 19th century when we had the revolution of 1848, 1849, for instance. In this complex process of subtle adaptation and subtle adoption of American influences to German traditions, Remy Grace in particular served as important mediators. Politicians as well as historians and political scientists, for instance, built bridges between Germany and the United States based on their experience of American exile and on their knowledge of Germany, they became key actors who disseminated their espousal, their pleas for a free, pluralistic democracy compliant with German political traditions. During an enforced exile in the United States, they had been confronted with a vigorous community-based democracy which was founded on a normative consensus about a civil society. Its essential ingredients were the recognition of a plurality of plurality, sorry, of interests and views, tolerance, mutual respect, citizens' rights, as well as social, social activity and broad political participation. These were at least norms. These were norms that were, of course, not identical to reality in the United States. By transfer, transferring American influences, which were amenable to the peculiar conditions, and particular conditions prevailing in, the, in Germany after 1945, these mediators ultimately, ultimately paved the way to the gradual process of democrat, democratization in Germany. Now, let me conclude. 
As we know, international cooperation quickly gave way to conflict and mutual recrimination between the Western allies and the Soviet Union after the Second World War. Moreover, historians have convincingly identified the seeds of discord between the victorious powers as early as 1944 and 1945. In retrospect, this period of collaboration in the first post-war years has therefore been downgraded as a fleeting moment, fleeting moment of peace, of international cooperation. International cooperation appears to have been an abortive attempt to secure a stable and peaceful post-war order. As a corollary, the potential for collaboration has been underestimated. The first years after 1945, in the first years after 1945, however, a genuine reconciliation and an effective collaboration between nations were possible and feasible. Thus, the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide was by no means coincidentally passed by the Universal Assembly of the United Nations one day before it adopted the Universal Declarations of Human Rights. So these were, was a package you know, of new declarations that were to secure human rights, that were to secure international cooperation, that were to promote peace in the international arena. Any comparative analysis of West German democratization, however, has to take the specific conditions in that country into account. In particular, the, the, the preceding collapse of the first German democracy, the Weimar Republic, from 1918 to 1933, the unprecedented atrocities committed by the Nazis, and the partition of Germany, and the beginning Cold War, emerging Cold War, rather. More generally, however, Germany was a defeated state occupied by the victorious Allied powers. There was an asymmetric power relationship in this form of cultural diplomacy. So power mattered. Democracy had to be installed as a political system before democratic values could take roots in West German society. And the process of taking roots, of course, needed time. In the transitional period of the first post-war years, remigres as well as Democrats who had survived the Third Reich, so the Germans, became invaluable mediators. And this adoption of democracy seemed to serve as a model to the world, a model for the promotion of democratic values, the promotion of civil society, and a model for securing peace and international cooperation. And even though these high ideals were to some extent undermined by the Cold War, we should keep a close eye on this transitional period, and we should not downgrade these efforts as futile from the beginning. This would be writing from the hist writing history, the history of the first post-war post years, from the end. And historians always have to observe the context. So my proposal is really to not to downgrade, not to underestimate the first years after the Second World War as an important window of opportunity for the promotion of international peace. And there were some measures, like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that may serve to secure peace, to secure the observance of human rights in the future. But of course, in the future, we need to adapt these measures to new challenges. And the United Nations, of course, have done so for instance, by the commitment to the responsibility to protect 
by the United Nations World Summit in the year of 2005. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, I look forward to your questions.